Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit, the podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we'll talk with Cindy Halverson, author of Real People, Real Faith in the Working Preacher Book Series. Welcome, Cindy, to our Working Preacher Books podcast. We're so glad to have you here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This is good. So tell us a little bit about who you are before we get into the book and how you got connected with Working Preacher Books. I am. I've been a pastor for several years. I've done pastoring of a a solo pastor of a small church. I've been on staff of a large church as an associate pastor and done various things. Um, Grew up in a pastor's home. Currently, I am not pastoring at a church. I am on staff at LeaderWise, which is a consulting organization that cares deeply for pastors and churches. And so now I am getting to pastor pastors and, um, and it's a great delight in my heart. And then I get to do preaching when I'm working with different churches and getting to do pulpit supply and all kinds of those things. So feels quite wonderful. So the way I got connected to working preacher was I had the privilege of doing a workshop at a craft of preaching event in 2019. One of the participants in one of the workshops that I did apparently was married to an editor for Fortress Press. And after the workshop, um, as the story goes, she went home and said to her husband, uh, I don't know, maybe this would be something that would work in that working preacher series that you've been telling me about. So I guess it's good to talk about work at home. It leads to things. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this book too is uh, also came out of your work that you did in the doctor of ministry at biblical uh, in biblical preaching at Luther Seminary. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. what a great process that was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this book uh, is called uh, that, as we said earlier, Real People, Real Faith. And it gives us uh, preachers a way to think about the characters, right? Preaching biblical characters in uh, in their preaching. And what does that look like? One of the things that you talk about uh, in the beginning, in your opening pages, that that scripture is complicated for preachers that you you mentioned that people read scriptures and it can be and it and it can be complicated even for preachers and that's part of what your book is like addressing is like how to uncomplicate it right how to uncomplicate the process and the reading and access scripture in a different kind of way so what are some of the barriers that have kept you from experiencing scripture fully? You know, like I said, I grew up in a pastor's home. So I've been in church my whole life. And sometimes we can have tapes that run for the way we have heard one sermon or one passage described over and over. And it can almost like, for me, anyhow, it was a way of kind of like, well, it can only have one meaning. Mm. And what do I do with that? And what if my life isn't really like lining up to that at this point? Or what if the way I've learned to know the divine is somehow different than the way I understood that passage when I was 10 years old, you know, that's a long time ago, a lot has changed. So to be able to acknowledge that some of that's going on for us just because we're preachers doesn't mean that that's not going on and then to get into the text and to sit with it with the hope of being able to I don't know like wiggle in I guess and to just sit with that text and let it have a different meaning for what I need right now or even when you know we're dealing with our congregations what our congregation might need right now. And I think sometimes, well, especially this post-pandemic, now endemic kind of time that we're in, I think as preachers, we're exhausted. Mm. And there's just, there's new stuff that we want to say, or that we wish we could say, but we're tired. Mm. And it's hard to get into scripture 
for ourselves as opposed to only thinking about how do I apply this for the other person or how do I teach this to this congregation? What is it that they need to hear? But to be able to take that quiet place in our spirit, which is hard to get to sometimes, but to get to that place so that we can listen by sitting in the text and letting the text itself hold us for whatever the divine might be wanting to say to us at that moment. You connect preaching with hospitality in the first chapter, writing that the sermon is the space where change can take place. Can you uh, just unpack that hospitality and change? Ah, yeah. Uh, Richard Rohr, I, I like him very much. He makes the comment that the soul is shy. And so the soul will want to run and hide if it's not a safe space. But if in our preaching, if we can open that up and for a person to encounter God, instead of us being so quick to say, well, let me change your view on something. And I'll teach you that out of scripture to support why I'm going to hope that I can change your view (laughs) or hope that you will change how you behave, whichever those changes are we're hoping for. But if we can just take a little bit of time and let our scriptures open up just for the purpose of encountering the divine and then letting the soul connect with God in those ways, instead of it being that it's just the head, but that we can bring all of our emotions and our feelings, our fears, all of that stuff that gets all intertwined and wrapped up. When we can sit in a story, we can see these ways that Jesus encountered people and helped them in those places, met their needs in those places. And so then that is that part of hospitality to have our sermons be a place where people are invited into a connection with God. I love that, Cindy. And you talk about this on page a little, well, throughout the book, but like on page 16, of this invitation into biblical characters as a way to connect, as you were talking about this, uh, 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 an integration, right? That so much about sermon preparation has been in our heads. And Mm -hmm. how is it that we can integrate by that listening to a character and identifying with a character to then listen with our hearts and our souls and not just our minds. And I found that to be really refreshing and freeing Mm. in in engaging scripture. Well, thank you. I do think that theologians through the last, you know, hundreds of years, especially since the enlightenment, right? I mean, the focus became Um, what can we measure? How can we intellectually engage with things? How do we do this? And then you've got the printing press, which meant education could be more available. People could learn in different ways. And I think the mind, of course, that goes all the way back to what Socrates and Plato, how, how the mind is the most important piece versus this other stuff that's part of who we are as holistic people. So to be able, I just, I happen to believe that God wants to care for all of that in us, mm-hmm. not just one part of that. Well, and yes, and related to that, you point out also in the book that sometimes preacher fe- preachers feel compelled to use scripture as a textbook. I thought that was really an interesting description of scripture. And I'm, yeah, absolutely. Or as an example, like the, rather than to tell the story itself. So help our, help our listeners think a little bit about this. What are some ways to move toward telling the story in ways that are life-giving to listeners? What are some of the ways that you talk about that in the book that you're not just, that's, you know, scripture is not just this textbook or an example, but you're, you're telling the story itself. I think the most important first, first, first step is to really recognize that the stories in scripture are real people. As we let them be real people instead of paper dolls or Barbie dolls that we can move around as we choose, but to let them have emotions, 
Um, they might have, of course, they're going to have archetypical fears and concerns around their lives and to let them be truly human. And then to be able to think about even that empathy piece can happen, you know, or to wonder in the story, you know, let our imaginations run between the lines <laughs> of what's written to be able to say, so what would it feel like if let's look at Luke seven, just as example, the sinful woman who anoints Jesus. So there's a lot of characters in that story. There's Simon, the Pharisee who invites Jesus in and hosts. Of course, there's Jesus. There's the woman. There are other disciples there likely. Um, all of them are going to experience that story, that experience from a different perspective. And then there are characters that are not listed, but are still likely there, right? Because there's likely someone who's serving that meal, someone who prepared that meal. What if they're on the outside observing this thing happen? How does, how might they have some kind of, you know, what is their experience from that? And, and then to wonder around that. One of the pieces that I will do at times when I'm sitting with a story is I might just play it through my imagination for a while, but it's not unusual for me to eventually say which of these characters most connects with what's going on for me in my life now, or which of these characters most connects for what's going on in our society right now those kinds of things around these deep needs that we have and the characters of scripture had those deep needs and Jesus responded to them. How do we get to tell the story? First off, envision the story, imagine the story for ourselves. And then how can we tell it so that the listener can connect to those characters? Yeah, one of the things you also talk about, and this just continues this thought, is that stories are not primary, primarily about information, hmm. um, but they're personal accounts. Um, one of the things I always emphasize in my own teaching is in Deuteronomy, um, Moses says, the Lord didn't make a covenant with our parents at Mount Horeb, Sinai but with us who are alive today mm -hmm. that in other words, the Bible isn't historical information about the past, but it's the stories that teach us who we are, who God is. What are some ways to, that you found to help personalize um, the story rather than the information? There's a shift that happens in our thinking there, right? Because if we're looking at a story for information so that we can call some great data and then create a principle, and not that that shouldn't ever happen. I'm not saying that that should never happen in preaching. But if that's our focus when we step into it, it's different than if our focus is, where is it that Christ is meeting the need in this passage? And then to, to give ourselves space to say, how does Christ meet that need for me? If I have that same need and Christ cares enough, I mean, it's just really incredible that Jesus would care. We can know that Christ cares for us because of this revealing of God, especially when it's the living word. I love that stuff around the covenant, Rolf, you know, that this is a, this is a living word. And how do I get to wrestle into the story? wonder about that and and then sit with it so if i'm going to do that how is it that i take that story with me and then even have empathy for the characters in the story you know try to think about what is that and how does that feel one of the things that you do in the book too is what you call capturing the contexts and the way in which, you know, when you when you were talking earlier about how preachers are so they they want the point, right? Or the they're eager to find, you know, meaning, at least for that moment in time. Uh, and but that 
that sense of, as you were talking about sitting and all the different contexts and that those contexts are meaning making. I think that's one of the yeah. real values of this, of this process or this way of approaching scripture that you realize how many details you overlook. Uh, so how the text feels and smells and sounds and, uh, and that's, and that is, yeah, that's a way that the text is, you know, you're engaging it in a different kind of way. One of the things I love too, that, uh, that you talk about in the book is the way in which, how is it, how is it that we pay attention or not pay attention to supporting characters, as you were saying in Luke seven, like we're always so, okay, we've got to talk about Jesus. So we're like focused on Jesus, right. Or like the main character, uh, and that interaction, but to, I, I love that of paying attention to the supporting characters, because that might be where someone connects, right? Like, I don't know what Jesus thinks and I don't know what Zacchaeus thinks, but I'm the, I'm the person watching this whole thing going on. Right. Well, and often, you know, I mean, there are times anyhow, especially if we're feeling, if the soul is shy, Right we don't necessarily want to think about what it means to be the main character mm. of a story, but to be somebody who's watching it and then asking those questions, you know, so what is, what is that and how does this unfold? Even inside the context, Caroline, thanks for bringing that up. Um, some of the stories, this meaning making becomes so significant when we realize, you know, like, so for the blind man in John 9, right? If we, if we understand what the context would have been about how my understanding is, is that he likely would not have been able to go to the temple for certain festivals, right? Because he's not whole. There's for some reason inside his society, he's considered that he should be kept over there. And all of that, well, when you hold that in there, and this story just came alive for me when I was holding that piece of information and then realizes, realized that Jesus not just heals him, but then tells him to go to the religious authorities and show that he's been healed. How exciting that had potential to be for him, because this was a place that societally, Anyhow, according to some of the understanding, he wouldn't have been able to do. And then in the end, they tell him, you can't. Mm -hmm. They kick him out anyhow. Mm -hmm. And so his hope, you know, this feeling isolated and, and not allowed to be in. Oh, maybe I can be in. And oh, no, I don't get to be in. And how all of that happens inside of us emotionally. And then before the story's over, though, Jesus goes and finds him. I love that phrase, when he found him. It's four words, you can run right past that. But if you're not, if you're looking at it from this sense of feeling isolated or that they didn't belong or whatever that is, and then Jesus said, you know, and the scripture says, when he found him, mm -hmm. well, that's a whole wonderful different way of holding that entire passage even though it has all those beautiful themes running in and out about being able to see and being blind and light and dark and understanding and belief and all of that. But then there's that other piece in there around if, you know, if the blind man could be a real person, if we can actually hold to that, that there's a real person here that's having a real life change here. Well, it gets to change it. Cynthia, thanks for this book, and I uh, really commend it to our listeners. I want to uh, switch now just to ask a few general questions about uh, the preaching process that we that we ask our guests on this podcast. Um, what's the hardest sermon or one of the hardest sermons you've uh, ever preached, and how did you get through it? Um, there was one where it was very challenging because of some of the pieces that had happened inside the congregation where I was serving. And there was a lot of emotions everywhere for everyone because it had been rather traumatic. And as I was sitting there waiting to 
you know, going to be my time to walk up and preach. I just remember thinking, I need to be able to hold the hand of God in this. And because of my imagination, as you can already tell, right, it's kind of has a way of going. I physically held out my hand and imagined that God took my hand Mm. as I walked up to the pulpit. And um, that, that was very helpful for me to just know that even I can use my imagination in that way of knowing that God is ever present to me. You mentioned Richard War the other day, or the, a little bit ago, and uh, so I yeah, am wondering what what other books or authors do you turn to when you need to fill yourself spiritually? Yeah, uh, well, yep, yeah, Richard Rohr, um, Barbara Brown Taylor, of course, right? So um, I really like Eugene Peterson. So. You know, the day he passed away, I felt sad. I felt like one of my mentors had um, had stepped to the other side. All right. So this is I'm going to ask you a really hard question uh, that we actually haven't asked anybody else just because of my history uh, knowing you. And that is um, I remember we were talking in class about how do you find your preaching voice that people you know, especially if you grew up in a house, all three of us, uh, our preacher's kids grew up in the house and, um, and you have to distinguish and find out how you sound as a preacher rather than how your mom or dad sounded. Um, and I remember that one person you, you said reported to you from a different class, I would not have allowed somebody to say this, right. Which is lose this blah, blah, blah about your, and, and the whole class really affirmed, no, no, you have to sound like you. Um, so how did you learn to do that? How did you learn? You've, you've got all this imagination and reflection. So I'm imagining that you actually reflected on, on it. But how, do you, how would you help somebody else? What advice might you give them to, uh, about how to find their voice? I think it's important to try different things. There are ways that... Um, you know, I can say something and, or think about how it would sound if I say something and I'll discover that that, but that's not true to me. I might be wondering, I might be trying to emulate someone else. And, but in the end, I have to do that self-awareness piece to pay attention to where I'm comfortable, where I'm not. And to find that. And Rolf, I went through that trying to write the book too. I had to find my author voice. And I, I kind of chuckled because I thought, well, I found my preacher voice. <laughs> now, how do I find my author voice? But to really have it, you know, to wrestle with it and to work with it and to try this and to try that. And sometimes I've also um, imagined that if I just had a, a friend sitting on the couch in my living room when I was going to write that sermon. What do I want to tell them about this text? What do I wish I could say to um, a friend or an acquaintance or someone specific in my congregation? Not that we ever preach specifically to one person, but when you know that somebody is dealing with a really hard loss, you know, if somebody has lost their job and, you know, somebody else has had the death of a dream. And then there's all that other kind of loss that we can have. What is it that I'd want to say to them out of this passage? And sometimes I just imagine them sitting on my couch. Hmm. I love that. And I think also you are, one of the things that you have at the end of the book is what you call a guide to imaginative reflection. Oh, yeah. And I, uh, and I, I love, I'm going to, I'm totally going to start using this in my class uh, to help students get into that kind of space. But that also seems like uh, a way to find your voice because part of what that, those steps invite is trusting yourself and your own experience of the passage. So let your senses guide you and and moving through the story slowly and so that you i think you're so in other words your process i think also is a way that that 
preachers can be affirmed in their voice and and trust trust their experience and their engagement with the text and that it will lead somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thank you. Thanks for that. I have found it to be um, life giving for me, but also very formative for me. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember once years and years ago before I was pastoring, um, asking another pastor a question about, you know, some theological piece and his perspective was very different than mine mm -hmm. and I spent some time trying to figure out if my perspective was I wrong was I wrong and it <laughs> took me a while to think oh number one maybe he's wrong <laughs> never or number two right um maybe there could be more than one way to hold this and maybe all of these pieces are what comes together to help us all as we're walking in this way of trying to discover this infinite God with our very finite minds and our finite experience. Awesome. We are going to turn to our closing set of lightning round questions. All right. And, and um, th these are actually questions that come from bandit the podcast so uh bandit asks what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat <laughs> oh oh um, my favorite animal is prob would probably be a yorkie only because we had a little yorkie oh hi bandit and um our yorkie th thought she was a cat <laughs> acted very cat-like and um, was pretty sure that no one was the boss of her. <laughs> awesome. Well, Bandit would also like to know what biblical character, character do you think would likely own a cat? Daniel. Daniel. He took care of cats. He was, right. he was the one able to control them. <laughs> <laughs> That is a good answer. And, yeah. you know, you, you said your Yorkie thought uh, she was a uh, cat. Bandit thinks he's a lion. So that's really, <laughs> that is a very good answer. Um, what's, uh, what's the strange, he, Bandit would like to know, what's the strangest place you've ever taken a nap? Oh, well, the strangest place that I ever have and sometimes continue to take a nap is on the back of a motorcycle. So my husband and I enjoy motorcycling together and he can, I can get really comfortable back there. And he always knows because then my head holding the helmet, right. And I fall asleep and it bonks on, on his helmet. And he's like, and you fell asleep again, didn't you? <laughs> I love it. And Bandit also wants to know what food you could eat every single day. Chips and salsa. Chips and salsa. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for being with us on this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org or follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher Books series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>